Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Serge. This is Joy. Um, we both work at Cisco. Um, we work <coughs> on a team, a small team that kind of builds the base OS for a couple of products. Um, these products are network appliances. Um, they're not like little nucks that you put next to your bed. They're big appliances that you put in a rack in a cooled room in a basement. Um, so people, when these things reboot, people don't want to have to run around and type in a root password. They certainly don't want to have to babysit the boot. Um, so we want unattended boot, but we need encrypted storage to protect customer data and whatnot. Uh, so to address that, uh, Paul and Joy presented two years ago uh, what we do. Um, yeah, so, in, oh, uh, sorry, not yet. In addition to that, uh, so we're, we're going to build on what was presented two years ago. Um, the next thing that our products have is that they want to be clustered. And so three or more of them want to work together to do some things. They, they're going to share some secrets. They're going to make decisions. They're going to configure switches. So we want to be choosy about who we allow into the cluster. So to that end, um, we use the Secure Unique Device Identifier, or SUDI. Um, it's just there's uh, specifications out there for device ID and whatnot. It's just uh, what we call it. Um, so when a customer buys one of these boxes, um, it'll be provisioned at a secure factory at an undisclosed location. Uh, part of that provisioning process is to make a SUDI key, sign the certificate with um, a CA that only the factory has access to. I can't sign one of these. Um, and put the, the product ID and the serial number into the certificate. And so we want it to be such that uh, at least a part of the cluster admittance criteria is that you present a, a SUDI certificate and prove that you're the owner of it. Um, in order for that to be meaningful, we need to make it uh, difficult or impossible to extract one of these SUDIs. So if you can either buy one of the products or hack into one and grab the key from it and then put it on an arm box and plug that into the closet, and now you can mess with the customer's data, that's no good. Um, and also, if you manage to hack in through an O-Day and make some changes, you can you know, add a service that has a opens up a root shell on some port, whatever. Um, it's one thing to keep you from doing that until the next reboot, but we want to guarantee that after the next reboot, there's no, no, no remaining changes. Um, so based on this, our use case is for, um, like I say, cluster admittance, uh, but this also should be useful for simple remote attestation. Um, and so therefore, while again, our use case is network appliances, we've also been looking at um, some teams where they might want to do IoT devices, which have a, some of the similar requirements. They want to do unattended boot, probably want to encrypt some file systems. Um, and if these things are roaming around the world, um, you might want some way of verifying that it really was your device and has not been tampered with if it's phoning back home, which you could be a company um, selling devices, or you might be just a, a, an individual and have your home network where you've provisioned your own IoT devices. Um, and then the other thing is um, cloud deployment. So if I want to do some uh, offload some computation onto the cloud, I want to just push a button and have it bring up a cloud instance and send my data to it. So again, I want definitely unattended boot, and I want to be able to prove to myself that I'm sending my data to something that, that's running software that I authorized. Um, and with confidential computing, we're hopefully getting to a point where we can do that even in the cloud. Even without Coco, we should be able to, on our own hybrid cloud, inside a firewall, be able to uh, have some guarantees. So to, to how we make that happen is what we're going to be talking about today. And Joy's going to start with the power on through a certain point in boot, and then I'm going to pick back up. Okay, um, this is going to be a really high level overview of Secure Boot and the features that we use for our MAS. So, 
A really simple definition is that Secure Boot is a UEFI firmware security feature that uses digital signatures to ensure immutable signed software is loaded during the boot price. So in other words, each step of the boot sequence is uh, verified from a previous step. And it does this using a chain of trust to make sure that only cryptographically verified binaries are executed. So in MOS, our chain of trust What's that mean? <laughs> okay, so in MOS, our train of trust uses the four key databases that are in the UEFI firmware. We, our root of trust is the, P, uh, the platform key, the PK, which is usually a single public key certificate, and it can be more than one. And it signs and verifies the key exchange key with the KEC, which is usually a list of public key certificates, and it signs and verifies the DB and the DBX. So the DBX is usually a deny list, and it's usually a list of hashes and public key certificates that are not trusted, that are that, of software that is not trusted. And then there's the DB, which is a allow list, and it's also usually a list of hashes and public key certificates that are a, a, uh, that are of binaries that are allowed to run. So our chain of trust also includes the shim, the uh, shim, the Linux shim, which is a first stage bootloader, and the Linux shim usually in, um, includes a built-in uh, vendor uh, allow and deny list. So we put three public key certificates in our shim, our shim's built-in trust database. And this is to allow for three levels of access, because what happens is like, um, so when the shim boots a UEFI binary signed with a particular key, it results in a PCR, a, a distinct PCR7 value, and we use that PCR7 value along with the TPM extended authorization policy to uh, uh, allow access to uh, certain secrets in the TPM. So we have a TPM admin public key certificate in our shim, and uh, its distinct PCR7 uh, value, along with the signed TPM EA policy, allows access to the TPM password. We have a production public key certificate whose uh, PCR value, uh, along with a signed TPM EA policy, allows uh, um, access to our Lux secret and our SUDI private key and certificate that we put in a TPM. And then we have a limited public key certificate which has special purpose in and has no authoriz uh, authorization to um, access TPM secrets. So I'll talk about that those three keys a little bit more in detail in the next few slides. So um, just a typical secure boot workflow, you see the UEFI firmware uh, loads and validates the shim using the key in its UEFI DB. And then the shim, our, the first stage bootloader, loads and verifies uh, the second stage bootloader, which is usually GRUB2. And and GRUB2, using the shim protocol, usually validates and loads the Linux kernel. And at this point in the boot service, the boot service is exiting, control is given to the kernel. So the kernel usually uses the unit RD to set up the, uh, a temporary root FS until the real one is mounted. And it may also contain other software or drivers like to do hardware, um, to access hardware partitions or whatever. None of that is protected. But in, okay, so in our um, MOS workflow, again, it's a typical one. The UEFI firmware uh, validates and loads the shim. The shim validates and loads the second stage bootloader. But in our case, the second stage bootloader is a uh, is our smooshed kernel, which we would now refer to as a unified kernel image, or UKI. And our UKI includes the initRD, so our uh, initRD is protected. Okay, UKI. UKI is usually a combination of a, boot, a UFI bootstrap, uh, a kernel, a NITRD, and other resources that are all put into that, this P, single PE file. And a UKI can be launched directly from the UFI shell or from a shim. And it, can also, it is also digitally signed, ver providing authenticity and integrity to all the components of the UKI. 
Our MOS UKI includes Stubby, which is our boot our stub bootloader. It contains a dot Linux section in the PE uh, file for the kernel, uh, dot command line section for the kernel command line, uh, dot initrd section for the initrd, and a dot sabat section for the sabat. And we sign and verify it with one of the three keys that I mentioned prior, just a few slides ago in the SHIMS built-in database. Okay, so Stubby, our, boot, our stub bootloader, it is based off the system DEFI stub. Now, securing the kernel command line is a bit restrictive, and we wanted to ease that restriction a little bit. So we provided a whitelist in Stubby, and the whitelist is pretty much, uh, I want to say it, it's... Uh, tokens that are allowed on the kernel command line. So for example, if you pass in a, uh, if the dot command line section is missing in the UKI, and instead you pass the kernel command line to the, to the UKI executable, then Stubby will um, validate that kernel command line. And if any of the tokens are found invalid, it will exi ex exit on error. Other, if you're in non-secure boot mode, it will just give you a warning and continue execution. And we also added support for, um, we did included support for adding runtime commands. Okay, so Moz also utilizes the TPM, some TPM2 features. So we utilize the PCRs, which the platform configuration regis registers, which are just memory in the TPM used to store measurements taken during the boot process. And software does a measurement, sends it to the TPM, and the TPM extends it into a particular PCR. And by extend, I mean it takes a hash of the current value in the PCR concatenated with that new value. And we also utilize the uh, TPMs in, in VRAM which is just memory, it's, uh, uh, and it, it's memory using, that usually contains two classes of data. One of them is uh, TPM data structures, and the other one is unstructured user-defined data that we're going to refer to as an NV, that is referred to as an NV index. And a, a user defines this, a, a size of this memory, and he, um, he, uh, uh, accesses it using that in NV index value. So NV indexes are the read and write access can be controlled separately. They can be used to store secrets during a boot process and access can be controlled by an authorization value or policy. Um, something else that we utilized was the TPM's extended authorization policy feature. So TPM2 has uh, so authorization controls access to the NV indexes, and, and TPM2 has many ways to authorize, and the policy is just can be a single authorization or a combination of authorizations. So we utilize a feature uh, in TPM2 such that you can seal things to, to, to a PCR value that has been approved with a particular digital signature rather than a particular PCR value. So in other words, the authorization is based on that digital signature and not just that PCR seven that PCR value. So, for example, if you have a uh, some software that has pr many versions of uh, several uh, versions or whatever, and each of those versions result in a distinct PCR value, then you can sign each one of those uh, PCR values, and it would represent or indicate that this is the approved set. Uh, this is the approved versions of software that can run. So in Moz, we use these features uh, for. To, uh, to, to authorize access to our, our secrets. So when we provision the TPM, we generate a TPM, we, a TPM password, we store it in the NV index, and then the, the PCR7, we use a PCR7 value to authorize access. So uh, PCR7 sign with a signed TPM EA policy. So what we do is we, um, so the PCR7 value that results when shim boots a 
binary sign with the U, a UKI TPM key. Remember those, those three keys that I mentioned prior in the shim? So one of them was the TPM key. So with the PCR value that results with that particular key, we generate a policy for it and we sign it, we signed it with our TPM poll admin key. There was a lot of keys going on, so I'm just gonna warn you. Um, we, so, so the policy generated with that authorizes access to that NV index to get the TPM password. And then we also uh, did something similar with the, uh, our Lux secret. So we, um, but we store it in the NV index, but we use two authorizations in order to ex, uh, access the data in that, in, in, authorize access to the, in, in, uh, the data in that NV index. So we use a TPM, one authorization is the TPM policy version value, and the other one is again that PCR7 value that results when we use our UKI production key, another key that we, I mentioned of those three keys in the shim. And the policy generated with these two authorization values, we signed with a different key, a TPM poll Lux key. And we decided to, we added the TPM policy version here so we could have the ability to uh, revoke a prior EAA policy based on a version number. Um, we also sec uh, secure our, um, SUDI private key and certificate the same way using that very same policy, sign policy that we use for the Lux secret. And that's it. All right. <clears throat> okay, so what Joy showed you was how we get to a point where either we, the PCR7 values are such that we have policies that let us unlock the TPM and if that's the case, then the initRD has to have exactly the values that we had signed, or we don't have access to the TPM, and then it doesn't matter. Um, you can boot whatever you want. Uh, but so what we want to do is, again, protect cluster admission and remote attestation. Uh, those services would run from some other container service, not from initRD itself, most likely. Uh, so now we want to extend the same kind of guarantee to the next stage. So the simplest way to provide an RFS to boot into from here on would be to create a static partition on the hard drive, Lux encrypt it with the Lux password from the TPM, and write the, the RFS to there. And then during initRD, we mount that and pivot into it. Um, that would protect from offline tampering for the most part, uh, since you, you have to boot into our initRD to be able to get the key for it. Uh, but it wouldn't. If, if you manage to hack in through some O-Day and make some changes, it would be hard to tell um, if anything had changed since install. Um, in addition to that, we also, one of the other things we wanted to do was really run a lot more things as containers, including have the RFS be a container too. Um, so that's another motivating factor here. Um, so now, since this is not ContainerCon, they're upstairs or something, um, I'm going to just have two slides about OCI because this is important. Uh, so the Open Containers Initiative image spec, um, that whole thing I'm just going to call OCI from now on. Uh, it was a standardization of basically the Docker container format. Um, you have an OCI layout, which has zero or more um, OCI images in it, each image being a uh, container. The OCI layout is all in one directory. Um, under that, there's a blob SHA-256 directory that has content addressed blob files that are usually JSON or tar.gz. But so if you, you can easily SHA sum the files to verify that the name is correct and detect tampering. Um, and the way it's laid out is at the top level, there's, oh my, what have I done? Guess I can't highlight. Uh, at the top level, there's an index.json which has among other things, an array of the container images that it has, and each container image section has a size, an annotation, which has the name for the image, and then a SHA-256 pointer into the, this other directory um, to one of the files, which is a JSON file, which is the actual image manifest. That file then has an array of layers where each layer is going to be traditionally a tar.gz file. 
And so if we wanted to ship our root file system as in this format, for instance, we would create slash sysroot empty. Uh, we'd read our manifest, and we would unpack the first tar file. Then we'd take the second tar file, untar it on top of the first one, and there might be some special files in there that are white outs that delete files from previous extractions. Um, and so we do that for each tar file in, in the set of layers. And when we're done, we have something we can pivot into. Uh, but you can see this has the same problem as the first suggestion of just unpacking the RFS in that once we've untarred everything, it's hard to tell what, if anything, has changed there. So a couple years ago, Tycho had the idea, hey, instead of tar.gz, let's use squashfs with DM Verity root hashes. And so that's what we actually do. Um, so we ship our OCI lay layouts like this, and during an iterd, uh, each layer that's needed for the RFS, we mount as squashfs with Verity, and then we take the overlay of that and mount it onto sysroot and pivot into that. And then we do the same thing for all the container layers that are going to run. Um, so now, as long as we can trust this information here, we basically have what we want. We, if anyone's made any changes, they'll be to a writable overlay. If they've made any changes to the blob files, they'll be detected by DM Verity. Um, changes to the manifest will be detected by the SHA sum of the manifest not checking out. Um, so now we get to the last step here. Um, when we whip up the next version of a piece of software for one of these products, what we do is build a ma an install manifest of the container images that it's going to have and some relationships between them. Um, one of the uh, services will be a special service type called hostfs. That will be the rootfs that we're going to pivot into. Um, once we've written the basic manifest file, we then run a, a publish uh, step, which will take all of the container, the, the OCI disk or the docker colon slash slash URLs, uh, mostly from internal repos. It'll fetch them, uh, check the signatures against cosine certificates that we've authorized for the namespace. And as long as those check out, it'll fill in the digest of the manifest for each layer in the, in, in the install manifest. So it'll, it'll add to it. Then it'll sign that and post that resulting manifest as an OCI artifact back in the container registry. So it's like a container image that isn't a container. Um, the signature and the uh, certificate for verifying that signature are then posted as other OCI artifacts referring back to the manifest. So we can say, hey, I'm supposed to boot from this uh, Docker URL. So we fetch that, and we say, OK, what are all the things that are pointing to this that are of a type certificate? Um, and usually there will be only one, but if there is more than one, one of them has to be, one of the certificates has to be signed by a manifest signing CA, which is on the initRD. So that's our final hook now. Since the initRD um, we know has to be pristine, we can trust the CA that's on there. So now our boot process looks like this. So we have maybe an EFI partition, either on an ISO or on disk, um, or we have Pixie boot or HTTP boot. Somehow we get a shim and a UKI. Um, we run through those, and as long as P the TPM gets unlocked, the PC that means everything was fine, checked out, and the PCR7 values were correct. So we trust what's on the initRD. Um, amongst what's there is the machine OS controller binary, which will do the rest of the setup for us, and the manifest signing CA certificate. Then if it's an already installed system, there will be a configuration, uh, an encrypted config partition, where we'll find uh, what manifest you want to boot from. Otherwise, we'll use the command line to figure that out. So that'll, that'll be, again, a, a dist OCI or Docker URL to a manifest. Uh, which could be, so they're, they're, if, if this is a live CD and not a network boot going on, then what initRD will actually spin up a, a little OCI um, registry instance against its local storage. Um, otherwise, if it's network booting, we might go out to uh, some zothub.io or something. So we'll get the manifest. We'll ask for the referring artifacts. We'll verify that the CA verifies the certificate. The certificates and the signature verify the manifest. 
the manifest has digests for all the container images. Everything else is content addressed and DM, verify, DM verity checked. So we now have what we wanted, basically. Um, another way to look at this, these steps, um, so again, the UEFI, um, let me just check the time. Oh, lots of time. The UEFI will verify the shim. The shim verifies UKI. PCR7 unlocks the TPM. While we're here, the first thing we'll do is we'll take the SUDI key and certificate out of the TPM and v-indexes. Um, and right now, what we're doing is putting them into a tempfs that's root-owned and schmod 700. Um, the plan is to actually not put them on the file system, but load the key into the TPM as a transient object so that you can do PKCS 11 operations, so that extracting the SUDI key won't be possible at all. Um, we load the Lux key and unlock all the file systems. Um, for now, we're then taking the Lux key and putting it in the root key ring. Um, that doesn't need to be the case. Once things are unlocked, we can drop that. Um, but once you drop it, you can't get it back without rebooting. So uh, that's a harsh thing. After we do that, we extend PCR7. So now the TPM is locked. And now we can relax, and we can go on, verify our configuration, create the root file system, pivot into it. Um, yeah. So on the plane, I'd made another chart on my phone, but I didn't get into the slide set. Uh, that was going to show how, how the key sets um, are structured at Cisco versus what we have here. Um, as Joy said, there, there are a lot of keys. Um, at Cisco, there's, like I said, the factory has its CA for creating the SUDI keys for machines. And then there's a team that um, has a lot of these, these other keys. They, they are the ones who build the kernel and the root file system, the, 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 not the root file system, the initRD. Um, they, they build all of the, the artifacts and sign the shim, sign the UKI, and have a manifest signing CA certificate, which goes into the initRD. Um, and so they, they, they build the shell, and then each product that uses this has their own manifest signing key and certificate, and their certificate has their product ID in it um, and is signed by the CA that's on the initRD. So you have one team that ships the UKI into shim, and other teams can all reuse that. Um, and during boot, uh, we verify that the, the product ID of the SUDI on the host and the product ID of the manifest match um, so that we can we, we, we avoid allowing product one's ISO or whatever from booting onto product two in case one product has laxer security standards or just something bad happened. Um, so that's how it's being done out, Cisco. That's all with, with hardware tokens and whatnot. But to have the community try and play with this, we needed something uh, different. So there, there's a trust program which will create all of this for you. And so you start by saying trust key set add and the name of an organization. And that will create keys for signing a shim, three keys for the UKI, EA policy signing keys, and a manifest certificate. It'll actually create the UKI um, with the CA, the manifest signing CA on it. It'll sign that. Um, It'll create the EA policies, and this, this, this is now kind of science fiction, but in a few weeks, this will all be automated. We just have some expect scripting to do. Um, but so it'll, it'll create the EA policies um, and create a data directory with, with all the signed data that you need to be able to boot. Um, and then once, so once you've created the key set, now you create a project, one or more projects, um, which are like, like our products, um, which will then have a manifest signing key, which you can later on use to it when you actually want to publish something. Uh, and it'll sign that with the CA um, and create a, uh, a UKI that can boot as a live CD or a provisioning or install CD or can boot as, uh, as an installed image. Um, and then the intent is that once you've done that, if you want to create a VM, you should just be able to say machine launch, um, give a project an organization and product na project name, um, give a serial number that you want to give the VM, and it should just automatically create the SUDI key, sign it, provision, install, boot, and then tell you when it's ready. Um, let's see what happened. 
Okay, I, I, I should ask here, are there any questions about this so far? Yes. Oh, oh she's going to. So you said right now the protection for the SUDI is that you drop it in the boot process? You mean on a running system? Yeah. Yeah, it's that it's sitting in a, a tempfs, um, okay. which no, no, none of the everything should run as a container, a new AD separated, so they, they they shouldn't be able to find it, and if they can find it, they shouldn't be able to get to it. Uh, okay, that's not the ideal. That's that's what we're doing here. Eventually, in, it'll be yeah. in the TPM. Yeah, and so you yeah you'd use PKCS eleven to do sign and encrypt decrypt whatever. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the promise of the talk was to talk about end-to-end -end secure OCI. Um, what we've mainly talked about here is the right side of this. Um, that's because the left side um, is basically already done and has been presented at, in other places. So one of the first things we did as a team was to, to build Stacker that was Tycho starting that again. Um, it's a container image builder that can run fully unprivileged. Um, any day now, it can integrate S-bombs, do cosine signatures and whatnot. Uh, one of the reasons we really needed it was that it's willing to create uh, squash FS-based file systems, which as you see are crucial to our security story right now. Um, we actually have someone working on, actually, Tyco started a file system in Rust called PuzzleFS, which will eventually probably take the place of the SquashFS approach, but that's in the future. Um, so for all the products, everything is built using Stacker and published to um, our Zot instance. Uh, so Zot, Ram wrote um, a containers registry uh, implementation, implementing the distribution specification. Um, this, again, it's willing to host SquashFS images, so we actually really needed this. Uh, Docker registry wouldn't do that. Um, we have big instances that run for all of our CI and all of our products. We also run tiny instances, like in init, in initRD, um, we run a, a tiny instance against localhost so that we can do our querying of uh, what refers to this manifest and things like that. Um, so the, these things are sitting on Zot with their signatures. And then um, here's where Project Machine now walks in. And we want to write our manifest, which lists what image, images to use from Zot. And it, it, they, they can come from various URLs. But the publish step will, will, will find those images, verify the signatures, um, get the digest of the, of the verified images, collate all that into a new object, which will be the install manifest which it signs and publishes back again to Zot, the container registry. Um, and then if there's a system that's already installed, um, MOS CTL, the controller, will, will just boot from locally. Otherwise, we can network boot or um, ISO boot or whatever um, and get, get layers from Zot on, even on the public internet. But we, we can verify that everything has not been tampered with. So a pure network boot is, is just as good as a, a local boot. So the, the code layout here right now is on, it's on our github.com slash project machine. This is subject to change. We're, we're still uh, figuring out, especially as we do PRs that have to go across uh, different projects that gets uh, fiddly. So we're, we're still gonna change some things. But right now there's a trust repo that's uh, for administering key sets and signing things. Um, machine, for the moment, is our actual VM runner. It will probably be renamed because we want machine to be a higher level thing where you really just say, machine run this from this, uh, or, or with this key set from that URL, just make it happen. Uh, but right now, instead, it's actually, it's, it's a lower level, it's a, Great tool for, for doing quick spin-ups of VMs that are secure booted um, with, with pre-provisioned um, OVMF variables um, with virtual TPNs. 
Um, it's again, it, it's a rewrite of an internal version that we have that does some more things that we, we want to also carry over, where it can start up clusters of VMs with expect programs hooked up to each console so you can have automated tests of, of complicated workloads where one is configuring a Pixie server, another one's then configuring an NFS server, and now we start off the network booters, et cetera. Um, anyway, Moz, the machine OS, um, Eventually, the idea is you would, you would never interact with this. You would use machine to do the publishing and the starting of things. Uh, for now, MozB is the builder. It builds the install artifacts. MozCTL is the controller which runs on the actual machines. Um, there's a keys repo, which is just a snapshot of the result of doing a uh, trust key set add and trust project add. Um, so that you, you, if, if you don't want to run that, you can download the keys and take a look and just see how things are structured. Um, and then there's Bootkit, which is, again, you're not meant to actually see this, but it has all the artifacts for building a shim, building a UKI, you know, within an idRD with everything provisioned. Uh, and it exports an API for doing the signing that uh, Trust will do for you. Um, so th this is still very much a work in proje project. Um, the way this has happened, a lot of what we've done, like see Stacker, Zot, and there's a lot of other things, were done from the first in the open. But the core part of this was done, um, it ha had to be done so that project, pro pro products could use it immediately. Uh, so it had to integrate with other pieces of build infrastructure, had to meet timelines and whatnot. So for, for a long time, every year we'd get together and say, okay, is, is now the time we can just open source it? And we'd say, well, we're not ready yet. So last fall, we said, that's it. We're going to do a grounds up re-implementation. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move the internal version over to that. Um, and that, so that's, again, that's what Project Machine is. Um, so the first piece of future work is just to finish what, what we're saying we do. Um, all the pieces work individually, but the, the glue is just not there yet. Um, we want to provide alternatives to a TPM. So right now, everything uses TPM. Uh, actually, two years ago, we were close to supporting another hardware token. Um, but in the end, TPM was available, and we ended up using that again. Uh, but there will be cases where we really can't or, or don't want to use a TPM. And so we will want to use a different approach. And that will be an interesting research project, because this is so tied into the, the, the TPM and UEFI secure boot right now. Um, we're going to need to support hardware tokens. So r right now, trust only, it keeps everything under dot local, share, machine, trust, keys. That's clearly not something you want to do as a company if you're going to be signing things. And it's not, not what we do. So if we're going to move our stuff onto this, we're going to have to support um, remote off, off, offline um, key generation and signatures and whatnot. Um, the actual install YAML that, that you define right now to write a workload is um, basically there for, for proof of concept purposes. Um, there are things which we support internally, which we don't support here yet. Um, and that's because we want to do a better job of being more generic and more um, having a better fit to what, we, what gives us the flexibility without... Uh, introducing insecurity. Uh, so for instance, if you're firing up an NFS server as an IoT device of some sort, you're going to want to have persistent disk mapped into some container. Um, that right now with, with this version is not possible. You're definitely going to want to have some services share some disk. One might be a key, uh, a KSM generating keys, and another, another thing might be Nginx just wanting to read a key from, from that, but not, doesn't need access to anything else. So we want that sharing to be supported. Uh, network configuration here right now, all you can say is empty namespace or share the, share the host namespace, but don't have privilege because you're in a user namespace. Um, definitely want to uh, be more featureful there, but the question is, what's the best way to do that? Uh, some people would say um, CNI. Um, it's out there, so it might be a good way. I don't know. 
Um, and then we really want to say that everything should run without privilege. There should be no server service running in the RFS itself, uh, except for things needed to run the container, containerized services, and those should all run in a UI, UID namespace. So to do some meaningful things like um, allow one service to say, hey, I need, I need another 100 gig partition, uh, we're gonna need some way of specifying privileged operations that containers can do. Um, so one research project that, that has been solved now for a little while um, would be codenamed Keyhole. Um, it would, you, you would take some language specification of things to say like this, this can talk to this service, this can run if config, hopefully not that, or hopefully a higher level, but anyway. Um, you, you would sign that with a owner key that Trust would generate for you and whose certificate the service, the, 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 the device has, so it can verify that, that you've, you've signed this. And then there would be a Unix socket so that you can do, um, uh, you, you can verify the credentials of the service uh, that's making a request and you can say, okay, is this service really allowed to make this request? And if so, then go ahead and do it. Uh, then building on that, um, right now we can install and we can reinstall, but we want to have an update daemon. Um, so what we would want to do here is on your device as one of the container services, which you can specify, you can customize, whatever, one of the things would be an updater that would just periodically ping a service, thank you, uh, on the internet um, and say, okay, are, the, are there new manifests? Uh, on the other end, on the public internet, you'd have something that would take your latest manifests and re-sign them with short-lived keys so that your, uh, your daemon can say, well, I don't see any new manifest that's been signed in the last week, something's wrong. Um, or if, it, if, if there's just been no updates, it would say, well, there's a new one, but it's the same as the old one, I don't need an update. Um, okay, we're down to five minutes, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, and are, are there any more questions? Sorry to make you run all the way up here for the <laughs> microphone. Um, so uh, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, I'm curious about a couple of different things. So uh, one, you are doing some uh, very intricate work to protect all of your keying and certificate material. Uh, um, do you have mechanisms to revoke certificates as part of this in case uh, one becomes compromised yes. in some way? And, and then, then uh, second is, uh, uh, I'm curious if you can talk about your use models for, for non-TPM uh, 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 platforms. By use model, you mean what, what, what use case we would have? Or what use you cases mean? you have, yeah. Okay, well, for that one, it's, every time I think we have one, uh, we don't have one yet, but, um, it, um, but we, we want, some, especially with IoT devices, they might not have a TPM available. We might want to plug in a YubiKey or something that would be able to... Uh, but for the first question, um, so Joy explained that the EA policies that protect the SUDI key and the LUX key, they're a two-stage. One is check the PCR7 value, and the other is check a TPM uh, NV index, which right now just says one, and that's the version. So to revoke, we would bump that version, and now all the previous EA policies would stop working. Um, that would be a fun day. That would be a fun day. Um, <laughs> But so the program that would have to do that would be an EFI, a small EFI binary signed with the TPM admin uh, key. We would never take a, a live CD and sign that with that key, but it'd be a tiny a single purpose thing that would say, let me bump this and. And the sabbat as well, couldn't we just, we can use the sabbat to also with key, re key, key revocation, just bump up the values in the kernel.efi for the sabbat. That might, okay. yeah. Uh, I have a question um, over here. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, you forked uh, the system you stopped thing into stubby thing. Any reason why? Um. Because the, the <laughs> things that you were discussing, like with the allow listing of the kernel command line options, we're discussing the same thing upstream. 
Um, this yes, and I, I think we, we, we want to go back to using the system D stub for that. Um, I, I think that was just a for for the sake of getting it done get thing. It working, yeah. But yeah, we, we, we don't intend so to be a fork. there's nothing specific um, weird in the in the in, in stubby that uh, we couldn't do upstream anyway. Um, well, right now probably just because we do the command line. Uh, filtering. Right so, for instance, we have some products that want to boot off of TTY0, some TTYS1, and so we have to change the command line there, but at the same time, we don't want to let you add rd.shell. So yeah, I mean, exactly that discussion is uh, okay. going on upstream. You should join. Then, yes, we, we will join that, yes. Yeah, we, we, we want to switch to that. So I just want to say thanks real quick to uh, the rest of the team, which is not here now, but we'll hopefully watch this later, uh, including some of our former team members, uh, Paul and Tycho. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yes. Um, and also, I, I, some of our former execs have been very supportive of us doing work in the open source, um, which has been a, a huge help here. So do you want to turn that off? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.